on World News Tonight. On Brinkmanship, US-China tensions expected to loom as China declined to participate in a joint defense meeting. Senegal in riot. Protests erupt in Senegal as leading opposition leader Songko is sentenced to jail. A losing case. Former Australian SAS veteran loses war crimes case after much deliberation and months of discussion. A celebrity beluga? A celebrity white beluga is sighted off Sweden after traveling from Norway. This is Ada Derna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening to you on this Friday night and you are watching World News. Now Ukrainians are still scrambling away from Russian attacks. The young girl, her mother and another woman were killed during a Russian missile strike on Kyiv after the air raid shelter they rushed to failed to open. Meanwhile, Russian's mercenary boss Yevgeny Prigozhin is laying more criticism on clowns in the defense ministry's war machine. The grieving husband of a woman killed during Russian missile strikes on Kyiv overnight into Thursday is saying that they had tried to get to their local bomb shelter during the attacks, but no one could open the door. There were women and children trying to get in, he says, when debris from a missile fell around them. Authorities say several people were killed in the incident, including a young girl and her mother, the 18th such attack by Russia on the city since the start of May. Russia has increased its missile and drone attacks on Kyiv in recent weeks, ahead of the expected counteroffensive from Ukrainian forces. In this attack, the Ukrainian military says Russia used 10 missiles and all of them were shot down. But the city's mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, says a fragment caused the deaths. We have uh, weeks long, uh, every day, the Russian sender came and gets the drone and, and missiles to our hometown. And a lot of people killed, a lot of buildings destroyed. Uh, we have a uh, 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 big part of people who have an injury. And uh, yes, of course, uh, people, uh, people very angry. People very angry. It's not the war, it's genocide against Ukraine, against Ukrainian people from Russia. Russia has accused Ukraine's forces of increasing their own shelling on border regions in recent weeks, including wounding eight people Thursday. Meanwhile, as fighting continues in eastern Ukraine, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of Russia's Wagner Group mercenary organization, says his fighters will finally leave the ruins of the city of Bakhmut on June 5th after handing control of it to Russian government troops. This video was taken during nighttime training drills. The pullout began May 25th and was originally slated for completion by June 1st. Prigozhin says the mercenaries will rest for about a month. He also continued his constant criticism of Russia's military brass, saying that his forces shouldn't have to operate alongside what he called clowns who turn people into meat. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky pressed his case for Ukraine to be part of the NATO military alliance as the joint European leaders in Moldova ahead of an expected counting, a counteroffense against Russia's invasion. Seeking to bolster Western support ahead of Ukraine's widely expected counteroffensive, President Volodymyr Zelensky pressed his case for his country to join the NATO alliance. Zelensky was joined by more than 40 European leaders who displayed a united front at the second summit of the European political community in Moldova. A symbolic meeting at a symbolic location. The war is at Moldova's doorstep as the country shares a border with Ukraine. An ideal location for the participants to reaffirm support for Kyiv, including France and Germany. We reiterated our agreement concluded on May 14th this year, aimed at providing air defense equipment in protection against Russian strikes. We also confirmed that we're ready to put in place the necessary framework to start training Ukrainian fighter pilots according to the needs of the Ukrainian Air Force. Opinions remain divided among NATO members over the speed of Ukraine's accession, with some fearing that a hasty move could bring the alliance closer to direct confrontation with Russia. A NATO summit is scheduled for July in Lithuania. Meanwhile, a third European political community summit is set for October in Spain. Tensions between the United States and China are expected to loom over Asia's top security meeting as China has declined a bilateral meeting between the superpowers' defense chiefs. 
U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on Thursday was greeted by Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in Tokyo, ahead of the Shangri-La Dialogue, a security meeting which attracts top defense officials, senior military officers, diplomats, weapons makers, and security analysts from around the globe. It is truly an honor to be here. But tensions between the United States and China are expected to loom over Asia's top security meeting, as China has declined a bilateral meeting between the superpower's defense chiefs. The event, which takes place June 2nd through 4th in Singapore, will consist of more than 600 delegates from 49 countries. Yet the Pentagon confirmed Monday that China's new defense minister, Li Shang Fu, who met with his Singaporean counterpart, Ong Eng Hen, Thursday for talks, has declined to meet with Defense Secretary Austin, blaming the U.S. for current difficulties between the two militaries. In response to a query at a news conference, China's defense ministry spokesperson added, quote, on the one hand, the U.S. keeps saying that it wants to strengthen communication. But on the other hand, it ignores China's concerns and artificially creates obstacles, seriously undermining the mutual trust between the two militaries. Meanwhile, Austin, speaking in Tokyo on Thursday, called it unfortunate that there would be no planned meeting. Russia's war in Ukraine, tensions between China and Taiwan, and North Korea's weapons programs will also be high on the agenda of many delegates at the dialogue, according to analysts. However, no Russian or North Korean government delegates will attend. Firefighters faced a grueling uphill battle against wildfires in Canada's Nova Scotia province, including one threatening suburbs of Halifax. Federal help was coming, officials said, along with firefighters from the United States. A smoke so thick and heavy that it turns day into night. Burning out of control, multiple wildfires are hitting Nova Scotia. Thousands have had to be evacuated from a 100 square kilometer area around the port city of Halifax and from another out of control fire further south. Firefighters say hundreds of homes have been destroyed by a string of blazes across the province. While they can't yet return home, some evacuees already know that there's little to nothing to go back to. I've seen a picture now. Uh, we haven't seen it yet ourselves because we can't really uh, go there yet. It's still uh, close. Our house is flattened. It's just the uh, concrete is left. You know, the, the chimney, I saw it, and, and the concrete, which is uh, maybe two feet high, or, you know, it's, it's all gone. Over a dozen fires continue to blaze in the northeastern Atlantic province. A few remain out of control. Officials say federal, military, and American aid is on its way. But the windy, dry weather expected until the end of the week has not helped. This weather is increasing in severity. Uh, it's going to continue to be dry. It's going to get a, even warmer. Uh, so uh, the prognosis is difficult. Likely thanks to improved fire prevention, there's been a decline in the number of wildfires in Canada since the 1980s. But such efforts have been hampered by climate change. For drier, extreme conditions mean that the fires that do occur, they burn more land and they displace more people than before. At least one person died in clashes after Usman Sonko, a strong rival to the president, was sentenced in absentia to two years in a trial that many Senegalese considered politically motivated. Riots broke out in Senegal's capital Dhaka on Thursday after opposition leader Usman Sonko was sentenced to two years in jail. The court ruling, which Sonko says was based on politically motivated charges, undermines his chances of running for the presidency next year. Sonko had been accused of raping a woman when she was 20 and making death threats against her. The criminal court cleared him of rape, but found him guilty of the separate criminal offence described in the penal code as immoral behaviour towards individuals younger than 21. Separately, Sonko is appealing a six-month suspended prison sentence for libel. Shortly after Thursday's verdict was announced, violence erupted at a central university campus. Protesters set a car alight and threw rocks at police who responded with tear gas. Demonstrations are not uncommon in Senegal and typically increase around elections. But President Macky Sall's second term has been particularly turbulent for a country usually viewed as one of West Africa's strongest democracies. 
That's partly because Saul's critics fear he'll use a 2016 constitutional change to bypass term limits. He's not ruled out running again. Sonko has also tapped into frustrations among voters around perceptions that Saul has failed to create jobs or improve livelihoods since first coming to power over a decade ago. On Wednesday, Saul launched a national dialogue aimed at easing tensions. He told assembled politicians, religious leaders and members of civic society that the government would ensure peaceful, free and transparent elections next year. However, the event was boycotted by Sonko and other opposition figures. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Now, following the North Korea spy satellite launch, was a request by member states for an emergency UN Security Council meeting. While details of such a meeting are yet to be decided, security cooperation is set to be tighter between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo. The UN Security Council has received calls to convene an emergency meeting in light of North Korea's latest satellite launch attempt. This is according to President of the Security Council, Lana Nuseva, on Thursday, following Pyongyang's attempt on Wednesday to fire a reconnaissance satellite into orbit. The attempt failed but has prompted widespread security concerns among the international community. According to Nate Evans, the spokesperson for the U.S. mission to the United Nations, the request was made jointly by the United States, France, Japan and others. Whether or not a meeting will take place will be decided after a consultation with UN member states. Meanwhile, the US, South Korea and Japan are further bolstering their trilateral cooperation after Pyongyang's botched spy satellite launch attempt. During a commencement address at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado on Thursday, U.S. President Joe Biden said the Allies are cooperating to strengthen deterrence against threats in the Indo-Pacific region, including North Korea. When it comes to China, Biden said Washington does not seek conflict or confrontation with Beijing. While saying the two sides should work together to solve some global challenges, Biden said the U.S. is prepared for competition and will stand up for its interests and values. And U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin called North Korea dangerous and destabilizing and said the U.S. is with its two Asian allies to safeguard peace in the region against North Korean threats. This came during a joint press conference after meeting with his Japanese counterpart Yasukazu Hamada in Tokyo on Thursday. We stand with our Japanese and ROK allies in the face of North Korea's continued provocations. And the United States will take all necessary measures to secure, to ensure the security of our homeland and the defense of our allies. The Japanese defense chief also emphasized the importance of trilateral relations to better respond to North Korean threats, including any other attempt by Pyongyang to launch a satellite. Long fuel queues return to Nigeria cities as motorists rush to fill their tanks, while some retailers hike prices amid uncertainty on the timing of the removal of a fuel subsidy that new president Bola Tinobu said would be scrapped. Tensions were running high outside this gas station in Lagos on Wednesday. People waited for hours to fill their tanks as the state oil firm announced it was hiking up its prices. They were hoping to get the old price, around 200 naira per liter, 43 cents in U.S. dollars. And today that they say they are trying to move them, the subsidy from the full way, and the subsidy is causing a lot of havoc. You can see everywhere for yourself, everywhere is blocked. Motor vehicles, cars are not moving. Humans, people are not going for work, no schools. Everything is so, so capsizing, nobody's moving. So it's so frustrating. And we voted for this government. Some gas stations have already adjusted their prices, like here in Abuja. It was one of President Bola Tinubu's campaign promises. As he was sworn in on Monday, he announced that the fuel subsidies were gone without giving a specific timeline. The first subsidy is gone. The state oil firm says that the subsidies cost it 867 million US dollars per month, an amount that the state can no longer afford. On Wednesday, it said the prices could still fluctuate to reflect market dynamics. 
The authorities have already tried to scrap the fuel subsidies in the past, like in 2012, but this sparked nationwide protests. Several people were reported to have been killed by police. One of Australia's most decorated living war veterans has lost a defamation lawsuit against three newspapers which accused him of war crimes in Afghanistan. Ben Robert Smith, one of Australia's most decorated soldiers, has lost his defamation case against three newspapers which accused him of war crimes in Afghanistan. The case relates to articles published in the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age and the Canberra Times, which, citing other soldiers who said they were there, accused Robert Smith of being involved in the murder of six Afghans during deployment. Their allegations included that he shot dead an unarmed Afghan teenage spotter and kicked a handcuffed man off a cliff before ordering him to be shot dead. Robert Smith had called the reports false and sued the papers, seeking unspecified damages. He accused them of portraying him as someone who broke the moral and legal rules of military engagement. But a Sydney court ruled in the newspaper's favour on Thursday. In light of my conclusions, each proceeding must be dismissed. Federal Court Judge Anthony Bisanko said they had proved four of the six murder allegations and therefore each defamation proceeding must be dismissed. Speaking outside the court, Australian investigative journalist Nick McKenzie said the soldiers who spoke out had been vindicated. I'd just like to say um, today is a day of justice. It's a day of justice for those brave men of the SAS who stood up and told the truth about who Ben Robert Smith is. A war criminal, a bully and a liar. Uh, Australia should be proud of those men in the SAS. They are the majority in the SAS and they stood up for what was right and they have been vindicated. The case has shone a spotlight on the secretive wartime conduct of Australia's elite SAS troops. Robert Smith was seen as a national hero after winning several top military honours, including the Victoria Cross, for his actions during six tours of Afghanistan from 2006 to 2012. He later carved out a post-military career as an in-demand public speaker and media executive. His portrait hangs in the Australian War Memorial. Tesla chief executive Elon Musk departed Shanghai, wrapping up a two-day trip to China in which he met government ministers, a key battery supplier, and visited the automaker's biggest production hub. Elon Musk has wrapped up a very quick and oddly muted visit to China. The Tesla billionaire was seen departing from Shanghai on Thursday in his private jet. That brought to an end a whirlwind two-day tour that started in Beijing. Hi, Mr. Musk. During the visit, Musk was showered with praise by the Chinese public on social media. But the man himself was uncharacteristically quiet, refraining from any kind of public statement. It's known that he met with the country's foreign, commerce and industry ministers. The sources say he also met Vice Premier Ding Shui Shang. He's ranked number six in the country's ruling Politburo. But little is known regarding what discussions were held. The industry ministry would only say that there was an exchange of views on electric and connected cars. Later in the trip, Musk visited Tesla's Shanghai factory. The company has been considering a major expansion of output at the plant, which is already its biggest production hub. Welcome back to World News and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Thousands of protesters took to the streets in Imokali, Florida to voice their opposition to a controversial immigration bill passed by Governor Ron DeSantis. The Senate bill titled SB 1718 aims to introduce stringent measures aiming to curbing immigration and strengthening human trafficking and unlawful status. California landowners and volunteers are learning the art of prescribed burns, which fire officials consider to be a vital tool to curb wildfire risk. In 2022, California launched a strategic plan for wildfire and forest resilience with the aim of treating 400,000 acres annually with controlled burns. From dazzling stage costumes to handwritten lyrics, personal items belonging to late Queen Front and Freddie Mercury will go under the hammer in September, allowing fans to purchase memorabilia once owned by one of the world's most famous rock stars. Indian opposition leader Rahul Gandhi criticized Prime Minister Narendra Modi's handling of relations with China. 
saying Beijing was occupying our territory while also taking a dig at the Hindu nationalist leader over the country's religious polarization. Tornadoes spawned by strong convective weather swept across some rural areas and northeast China's Liaoni province, injuring a dozens or so people and damaging croplands, residential buildings and agricultural facilities. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end off tonight with a visit to a celebrity white beluga sighted off Sweden from Norway. Have a great weekend. Good night.